Pharmacies, so based in the Burdekin office. Um, and today we're just going to be talking about some nitrogen use efficiency trials and um, some proximal crop sensors. Um, so a big thanks to Wayne Delsano, um, Richard and Rochelle Kelly and Wilmar Farming Company because without them we obviously wouldn't have been able to do these trials. Okay, so the aim of the project was basically in some of the newer nitrogen, more nitrogen efficient varieties, are we able to reduce the amount of nitrogen that we put on in turn, try and increase our CCS and try and find that sweet spot with tons of sugar per hectare where we can make the most money. <coughs> um, we also wanted to use proximal sources to try and identify the different nitrogen rates in the paddock um, or identify any yield management zones. We also wanted to look at the water quality runoff from the different end rates and um, to see if we could have, like, find any potential improvements in water quality when we reduce our end rates. Okay, so first trial, this was in the Airville region in the Burdekin. So we had three treatments, 206N, 164 and 147. And it was replicated four times across the paddock in a randomised strip block trial design. Okay, so yield results for the first year. So it was Q240 first for two. Um, and there was no significant difference in either tons of cane, CCS or tons of sugar. Um, Matt from DAP is going to just quickly run through the economics for that. Okay, so uh, as I did before, I'll just run through uh, the variable costs uh, at the trial site for the different treatments. So with that trial one, we reapplied it for a second year, but we also added um, some KP samplers, which are just like little water quality monitors at the end of the paddock. So we put them in two replications um, just to see what was actually coming off that paddock. So we should have that data back to you guys by next year, next forum. Um, so we, we ran some OptiRx and Green Seeker sensors over the paddock um, just to try and find We did, um, we did pick up some in paddock variability. So that could potentially be used for, um, for variable rate applications um, in the future once we do some ground truthing. Um, so we did biomass sample that paddock just to see um, what the nitrogen content in the leaves were to try and match them to the reflectance values. Uh, we got a correlation of an R squared of 0 0.14, um, which for those of you in the room should know that um, yeah, it's not a great correlation. Um, so we can be pretty safe to say that in this particular paddock, nitrogen wasn't driving the difference in the reflectance value of the cane. Okay, so trial two. Um, this was in the Mulgrave region in the Burdekin. So four treatments, 223, 201, 181, and 162. And then that was replicated three times across the paddock. Okay.
Okay, so we ran the proximal sensors over this trial as well. Um, so again, same story. For this particular paddock, we didn't see any distinguishable end rates. Um, but the spike in CCS that we were hoping with the lower um, nitrogen rates. Um, but I mean, we had a fairly, well, we had rain around crushing, so that could be a contributing factor. Okay, and in terms of the variable cost of this trial site, uh, again, the high Um, what we found was that the 190N was losing the most nitrogen and it had roughly 2 kilos of N per hectare runoff um, over those nine irrigation events. Um, the 150 was also next highest followed by 110 and 0, which is, um, which is good. And then about 50% of the 190 runoff um, can be accounted for by organic N or Cal um, So that, that was running off the 0N anyway, so you can expect that it would be running off through the 190. Uh, so we put the proximal sensors over this paddock. Um, we could see the zero end quite clearly, so on the left hand side Like that alone is pretty astounding. And we just need to keep harvesting to see the effect over like many years. Like there could have been residual end left over in the soil um, and that kind of thing. What we learned from the proximal sensing was that it's really hard to get on a paddock in the vertical between irrigations and rainfall and the cane growing really, really, really quickly. Um, but drones can be really useful in trying to get that data. We've got a drone hooked up with, um, with those um, sensors, so we're able to you know, map the crop at any time. Um, they do have their own setbacks though, like I mean, if it's cloudy conditions, you're not going to get a good map. Um, if it's too windy, obviously you can't fly, those kinds of things. And even though in those paddocks there wasn't a correlation with nitrogen uptake, sensors can be really useful to um, just to identify other limitations like soakage and salicity, so, salicity and salinity. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs>
They were first retunes when we applied them, so they've been cut as um, first retune and then we've reapplied them again. So we'll get data off the second retune as well. David? Now, it's um, really interesting to see that you couldn't see a difference in the green or the, the green seekers, even though you were really nitrogen stressing that no nitrogen trial had applied. Is there anything that you could think of that was uh, causing that? Or what's your thoughts on why you couldn't pick that up? Um. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure. Like, visually, when you're looking at the crop, like, you couldn't notice a very big difference. Um, and I guess it, that was sort of reflected in the yields that there wasn't a statistical difference, except for the one where the sensors did pick up the zero ends. Like, that obviously came out statistically different. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. So, there was that last uh, trial that you did, which was that one you could see it. Yeah, yep, that had the 28 drills of 0N, and you could see those strips, but only the 0N was picked up. The 110N wasn't still. Yeah. Uh, do you think you get a better um, what do you call it, a visual of the seed than when I when the cane was bigger? Like, can you grow them or not? Yeah, yep, yep. So we've, we've been flying the drones over. Um, like the cane's pretty big at the moment, so we're due to do some sensing. Um, we also did some work at Paul Villas's, and we used a high rise track the biggest problem is that you've got to maintain like a 50 centimetre above the crop canopy. So to try and get high enough over the cane gets a bit tricky. Um, what we find is that the older the cane, the more the zero end usually stands out. Like it might not be noticeable in the first few months of the crop, but once it sort of gets up around six months, you can really pick the zero ends. So, yeah. yeah, that's what I've noticed. If the crop that we hit the lower end rate, the bigger the cane, you do see it. Yeah, yeah. Um, not, not really, no. So um, both, two of them are out of Claire, so they're channel water, and one of them has about three milligrams per litre, so it roughly works out to maybe 30, but it's hard to say. Uh, are these trial sites being replicated year on year, or do they get them one year run? Um, so we've applied all of them for a second year. Um, so yeah, once we harvest this year, we'll see what the results are, and hopefully we can keep continuing them for a third year. Why I ask the question is I'm just wondering how much we did for nitrogen. Yeah, I agree. So I said about <coughs> that original, that, that first lot of data set. Yeah, no, Maybe definitely three agree. Maybe in three years and you'll have a better, better identification of what's actually happening in the field. Yep. Okay, so we might uh, just wrap up there and uh, getting the, the time from the, from the NC. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, Okay, so moving on to our, uh, our second presentation, it's uh, pharmacist, so we've got Natalie and uh, Tony, Tony Pajaya, and the uh, trial that they'll be discussing is using crop sensors for variable rate nitrogen after soybean. So uh, welcome to Natalie and Tony.
I was a little bit um, annoyed. I thought she'd come to see me, but no, she only wanted to visit a project catalyst farmer, so uh, I missed out. Um, <coughs> the top photo. Uh, if Jerry Warris in the audience, Jerry, you can ask Natalie. I was not kneeling down on this crop of soybean. Uh, this other photo is a uh, crop of cane that we cut after a uh, good crop of soybean. Uh, cut around 179 to 100 hectare. And with that we put on, it was 28 units of N uh, pre-planned. What we are finding since we've been um, playing around with soybean, we've been planting soybean for nearly 18 years now. Um, I feel our biggest issue at the start was the actual seed itself. Um, I felt uh, I think Mackay might have been a dumping ground of some crap seed. Uh, whereas now um, we get a good line, we use Jay Musket to uh, our seed supplier, and um, uh, I think uh, it's making a hell of a difference. And uh, with our soil type and our rainfall, we are getting um, variability in our strike. Um, every now and then, oh yeah, I suppose there's a gap there, that's my, it's my fault, the cleaner blocked up. Um, but <coughs> we're getting variability in the crop. Uh, we just planted uh, into a very uh, like high moisture ground and we got a damage of rain on it and uh, packed by concrete. Uh, had a bit of an issue in striking. Um, so we're looking seriously at how we can overcome this with the variability in the soybean. Yeah, this, this is what happens. Like you've got either corner of the photo, it's quite good soybean, strip in the middle, just probably a different soil type. Um, you know, how can we overcome that? You look at this, the crop here, the top corner, uh, if you disregarded that crop of soybean and uh, top dressed a lot with a full rate, you would basically double the amount of nitrogen. And uh, everybody knows that you double the amount of, double the amount of nitrogen you certainly got to get a flock of CCS. So in 2015, we um, established a trial and that was applied in 2016. Um, so we were looking at um, targeting the nitrogen rate according to the um, following a variable soybean crop. Um, we are looking at evaluating the, the crop sensors and drones, how they how well they spatially locate the variability in the soybean and what nitrogen is supplied back for your plant cane, what, how much is there. And from that we're looking at um, how, how do we decide on how much nitrogen to use following a legume crop in your plant cane. And then of course assessing the economics that go with that. So in 2016, you may remember last year I introduced this trial to you. Um, two op OpDirex sensors were mounted on the boom in front of the tractor. Um, the scan, the soybean biomass, uh, Alice described before very well, thank you Alice, how they work. Um, in 2017, we felt that um, it was a little bit too close to the, to the soybean crop, the sensors, so they were mounted higher. Um, and it, this was occurring the same time as normal operation of rolling the crop, so there was no extra operation needed here. Technology. Yeah. So this video is just showing you um, how the crop was sensed. There's um, two sensors there at the front of the tractor sensing the, the biomass of that soybean crop in front of it. Um, as you can see, they look quite close to the, the soybean, so that's why this year they were um, put a, a, mounted a bit higher. But you can see how good the, this was the 2016, 15-16 uh, soybean, it was quite a good biomass there. So this was the map that was produced from that um, that activity of, of the sense. Um, this was so sh 
identifying the zones of the, the low yielding soybean are in the red to the yellow, red is the worst, and then the blue is your highest yielding soybean. Um, so from that, we've um, identified some zones here where we want to do our sampling. So there's sample points in the low yielding, and then we also sampled in the high yielding paired samples there. Um, that's where we did the harvest of the, of the cane as well as the soybean biomass and the uh, soil nitrate tests. So these were the treatments that were applied. Um, in the high yielding soybean area, no um, nitrogen was applied. The soybean crop was supplied plenty of nitrogen for that next plant cane crop. Um, in the low yielding soybean area, Urea at 270 kilos per hectare was applied, so it was it was putting urea on or off. It was either on or off, and, the, and that's the the tractor that applied it. With, that's the box that has all the variable technology in it, and that was our little fertilizer box, just one row, just for the trial purposes. Um, so this is the um, the cane sugar yield from that site that was harvested in August of last year. So as you can see, there's no um, difference between the two treatments. Um, in the low yielding soybean, there was a, I've got tons of sugar per hectare there graphed is 19.6 compared to in the high yielding, which received 14 kilos of nitrogen, was 19.9 tons of sugar per hectare. And down the bottom, it shows you the tons of cane that were achieved. There was no statistical difference between them. 154 in the high nitrogen rate compared to 153 in the 14 kilos of nitrogen to the hectare. And no difference in CCS. No statistical difference anyway. So Brendan will just present on the Thanks, economics. Um, before I get going, I just want to say thanks to Tony and Natalie and Mark for the input. I know I've been bothering you guys for all the numbers, so I really appreciate that from the department side. If we look at the cost side, so again, uh, following on from what Matt and Titch have also presented, the variable costs. So if you look at the structure, of course, the main driver being the lower fertilizer cost when looking at the high soybean uh, yielding areas. And uh, you can see there is about um, $177 difference if you're comparing the two total costs. Uh, again, a lot of the costs are very similar. Um, for those that are linked to yield, for example, um, the orange here, you can see um, the harvesting costs. Very little difference, again, because the yields are so close. So again, yeah, so most of that $177 is attributed to the fertilizer and application thereof. Thanks. And uh, just to finish off, this is the gross margins per hectare. You can see $259 uh, more for the high-yielding soybeans. So uh, there were two sides to it. One side was a saving on fertilizer. The other side was a slightly higher CCS. So that played a role in improving the gross margins on that trial um, or, or on that uh, treatment. Uh, but again, as with a lot of these biological trials, there wasn't a statistical significant difference in those two numbers. Um, really just, again, given a, a lot of variety, a lot of variation within each treatment. So unfortunately, that plays against us when you run the statistical analysis. So yeah, that's from our side. So in the 2017-18 season, we set up a new uh, site um, looking at varying the rate of nitrogen up the row. So this is the site here, just not far from um, the last year's site. And that map there is showing the variability of the soybean crop. Um, again, your high yielding soybean is your blue um, and your red is your, your low, lower yielding soybean. Um, within that block, um, we've set up the trial in this, in this strip there. Um, we had a full rate of nitrogen strip in six rows, and then the next six rows is where we're doing our assessment. So the whole paddock actually got a variable rate nitrogen application of that, that map. Um, 90 kilos of nitrogen per hectare was the lowest to 110. So you would have noticed there, we only reduced the nitrogen rates um, that year by um, 35 to 50 kilos of nitrogen. 
Um, there wasn't a lot of nitrogen left there uh, when we did our night straight strips at top dress. Um, it, it told us that was from sent to the lab, sample sent to the lab as well, there was only 50 to 35 kilos of nitrogen. Um, so maybe a reason why that could be, we looked at the rainfall data um, that followed after that soybean crop was actually sprayed out. So this one was, wasn't rolled, it was sprayed out um, at the end of March. Um, so as um, we've been talking about all through the day, um, everyone would remember what happened at the end of March. Cyclone Debbie is this rainfall event here. Um, and then there, there wasn't a lot of rainfall following, but uh, a lot of people didn't expect there to be a lot of nitrogen left after any soybean crop, just the amount of, of rainfall that fell. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's quite a considerable time difference between when the crop was sprayed out and when it was top dressed. Um, it was cultivated um, not, not long before planting and it was planted in July and then we don't top dress until actually September. So when making decisions of how much nitrogen to reduce in, in your soybean crop, it's quite a difficult thing to decide on how much to actually reduce it by. And it's because of all these variables in between and there's not a lot you can influence in, in rainfall, but um, just trying to work out how much nitrogen to actually reduce it by can be quite a difficult decision. Um, as well, we took um, recently some deep cores down to 90 centimetres in, there is a sandy soil in this block as well as a heavy soil. That's where the, the poorer yielding soybean is actually in, in the heavier soil. It's a pretty heavy glue pot sort of um, soil um, compared to the sandy, sandy loam at the top of the paddock. So there's just got two cores, two of the cores from here. The sandy soil is, is your orange. So we start at zero to 10 centimetres, going down 10 centimetre increments down the profile. Um, this is uh, kilos of nitrogen per hectare that was found. So as you can see, there's a little bit in the top soil and then the heavy soil quickly, it, it drops away and it, there's nothing there sort of from, from 30 to 40 centimetres. Um, whereas in the sandy soil, um, 68 kilos of nitrogen was found between 40 to 70 centimetres. It was actually found in, in, that, in that profile of soil. So what, what could have happened after a huge rainfall event of Cyclone Debbie was that the heavier soil would have been um, waterlogged for a long period of time, would have denitrification, de all the the nitrogen would have been lost to the atmosphere, whereas in the sandy soil it would have been more likely to be leached. And then some has actually stopped at, at this part in the profile. So that's why we're finding so much nitrogen. So when we actually, as you would remember, I said not much nitrogen was found in the nitrate test because we were testing from zero to 20. So it's actually in the sandy soil where it was high yielding, it was actually further down in the profile. So how, how do we decide how much to reduce our nitrogen in plant cane, following any legume crop? So on that handout, you'll see, so we've been doing these for a number of years now. Um, it's just a, a simple, quick, reliable test that's real-time data for real-time, like your decision, you want to decide how much fertiliser to put on at top dress. You want to make decisions within that hour. You want to um, know how much nitrogen is there right when you want to fertilise your last um, application on fertiliser on that paddock. So we just identify our high and low yielding zones. We take the soil sample. Um, um, we have a solution of aluminium sulphate in our tube and then we dip our nitrate strip in. And it'll tell us, it'll give us a good indication if there's no nitrogen there a little bit there's heaps or there's just heaps of nitrogen still there. So yeah, it's just a really good tool that we can get a, a decision in an hour of, of what fertiliser we can put on. Um, and these were, we within this trial, uh, 
at, at top at top dress, we sent away the samples that we did the nitrate strips. We also sent them to the lab to compare. Um, are, are we confident in how much nitrogen we're reducing in from these strips? Um, we found very good correlations between um, the nitrate stripped compared to the lab result. They were giving correlating. We got an R squared there of 98 percent on treatment one and 98 percent point six on treatment two. So we're, we're really confident in. The nitrate strips are at least giving us a, a very good indication of how much nitrogen we can reduce at, at top dressing. Much. And then on the other side of that handout there, it's got um, how you may influence how much nitrogen you could reduce the losses of how much nitrogen from the, from the soil. So if, you, if you've got a legume crop, um, is it nodulating? Is it nodulating well? Um, if you've seen a yellow soybean crop, it's not nodulating well, but even sometimes a green crop, you want to be checking how much, is it, has it nodulated well? Because that'll indicate whether it's putting nitrogen back into the, the soil. Um, if, it, if it hasn't, you can pretty much say that little nitrogen is being produced and you'll, you'll want to top dress at your normal rate. If, if the nodules are healthy, um, how was the crop stand? Was it uniform or was it gappy? If it was consistently gappy, you would probably look at a normal nitrogen top dress or you would consider zonal if it was in patches. You had um, really gappy patches in the paddock that you might want to zonally look at the option of zonal nitrogen application. If your crop was uniform, you would make a decision when to plough it in according to if you were going to plant your cane um, soon after early, an early plant, or if you were going to plant late, you would want to delay your cultivation so you would reduce your losses of nitrogen, either through le leaching or de denitrification. Because once you start breaking it down, it'll, it'll start being lost quicker. So the, if you can leave it as it is for the longest time possible, that's the best way to ensure to reduce losses. But pretty much, to make a decision on, on how much actually nitrogen should reduce, you reduce, they all come to the same decision. You want to um, do um, a nitrate strip or a, or a lab test just before you top dress with nitrogen. So you can take, so you can adjust your nitrogen rates accordingly to how much residual nitrogen has been left from that um, any legume crop. So thank you, thank you to Tony and to everyone else and pharmacists who's done all the hard work in the paddock and Brendan. Any questions? Yes. With the, um, did you do any uh, the, of the nitrate test strips with the, um, if there wasn't healthy nodules? I was just under the understanding sometimes yep. if it doesn't nodulate, uh, the reason can be there's already enough nitrogen in the soil. I'd be, I'd be just um, saying, we, some, we someone haven't made, done, oh, I haven't done Yeah, I'd just like to ground truth that because I did get told sometimes yeah. if it doesn't nodulate, it's because the ground's already saturated with nitrogen. Yeah. Um, I'd just still, I'd like mm. to see if that's true, yeah. you know, like, yeah. Yeah, well, I've been, I've been told that too, but um, <clears throat> uh, we try and put um, around 100 tonne of hectare of filter press in our fallow. And when, before I started doing that, I had heard that and I was worried that that would happen, but I haven't found it as of yet. Okay, so um, yeah. You should still find nodules if, if your bacteria is working. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. And this year we had um, one block in particular, we, it went on about 125, 130 tonne of the hectare, and I haven't checked its nodulation yet, but it um, looks nice and healthy and green. Thank you. Maybe I should explain myself a little bit. The reason we were using the roller, um, first of all, we don't take our um, soybean to bean. Uh, we feel our soil needs every little bit of goodness we can put back into it. Um, the reason we use the roller is because a lot of the times uh, we're finding it hard to get the chemical through the canopy. If you've got um, nut grass in the, uh, in the uh, ground, we're finding hard to get into the canopy, so the idea is knock the soybean down with the roller, probably kill, oh, I don't know, 75, 80 per cent of it with the roller, and then you let a flush of grass come through, then we um, hit it with uh, Roundup after that. 
Um, Tony, Michael Waring here. Um, in the first trial, did you take nitrate samples, soil samples prior to um, top dressing, the same as you did this year? Yeah, or in that's 17, right. sorry? Yep. You did? That's correct. Um, and, the, and obviously, because you lowered the nitrate, nitrogen application down yeah. a lot more, that was a lot higher that year. Um, yeah. My question is that you said that in 17, we had the cyclone three weeks or something after you killed the soya beans. My understanding is that if the soya beans, are, they, you said they were sprayed out and they were standing there, they sh in my mind, they shouldn't have lost the nitrogen in that three-week period should it should have been all still tied up in the plant because the plant would have been wouldn't have been deteriorating yet or breaking down and yet you still lost all that nitrogen is is there possibly another reason for losing all that nitrogen um there could be for sure um yeah a lot of nitrogen was it was over 100 kilos per hectare of nitrogen found the first year um but we didn't receive the same sort of rainfall event it's yeah. It's assumed that it's probably from that rainfall that all that nitrogen was lost. It wasn't as big a crop it was as it was in 2016, so it wouldn't have been given as much nitrogen anyway. I think there was also a fair delay between um, when you sprayed it out and cultivation in 2017 as well, wasn't there, Tony? Yeah, yeah, that's which, right, John. Which may well have contributed. Yeah, that's the reason why um, with cultivation we do as least as possible till we're basically ready to plant. And um, basically cultivation last year would have been, I think we might have uh, ran over it with a speed tiller. And then before we plant, we'll um, zonal rip and zonal rotary hoe and plant the same day. And just adding on to that answer, Michael, like um, it just shows you that things can happen that we don't necessarily expect following a legume fallow yep. and, and sort of that reinforces, I think, the importance of taking a test at top dressing time to make the right decisions because sometimes things happen that we don't really expect and, yes, we wouldn't have thought following that rainfall relatively soon after the spray out that we wouldn't have got that amount of breakdown and mineral nitrogen able to move down the profile but we did, you know, the evidence is there. So it does show that seasons and circumstances and that are all different. So no one can give you a one size fits all uh, remedy. So at the end of the day, the take home message really needs to be, don't guess, go and do a measurement. They're cheap, quick and easy, and then you can make the right decision. Yep, thank you very much, Rob. Yeah, like uh, Rob just mentioned, that just uh, confirms the benefits of precision agriculture and the way we're moving as an industry, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Natalie, Brendan and Tony for that presentation and uh, just give them a round of applause. <laughs> thank you very much. So we're going to catch Sorry? Him. I was ready to catch him. Oh, OK. Uh, we'll move um, north now. We're going to go up to Ingham. So I'd like to uh, welcome Lawrence Hayden um, DeBella and Megan Zimmel to the stage uh, to talk about their mixed fallow cropping trial. So I'm actually not going to say too much. I'm going to leave it to the other. So I'd like to introduce, firstly, um, Megan's our project catalyst officer uh, at HCPSL. And I'd like to actually introduce my eldest son, Hayden DeBella. He's still at year 12 and he's hoping probably to be a farmer, I think. That's what he's hoping to do at the end of it. So I'm going to leave the presentation of these guys and uh, I'll come back at question time. Mixed fallow cropping trial for 2016 to 17. A mixed legume trial was conducted at Lawrence and Hayden de Bell's farm 2016 to 17. The trial assessed Will mixed fallow crops increase biodiversity in soils? What is the impact of nematodes from having a mixed legume fallow? Will having a mixed legume crop improve weed control? 
what nutrients becomes available after a mixed legume crop. These are the species that we assessed in our trial. Cowpeas, variety ebony, canola, sunflower, variety white stripe, lab lab, variety rongi, lab lab, variety 527, dismanthus, variety 5 and 6, soybean, variety leichhardt, pigeon pea, sun hemp, variety tropical sun, and combination of these species. Mix one, soybean, dismanthus, ebony, cowpea. Mix two was soybean, sun hemp, and ebony cowpea. Mix three, soy, soys, lab labs, rongi, ebony cowpea, and ebony cowpea. Mix four was soys, canola, ebony cowpea. And mix five was soys, and both lab lab varieties. All right, so we had a small plot replicated design. Um, each, each plot was three rows on 1.83 meter rows by 10 meters. Um, it was replicated. There were 15 different treatments. Uh, they were applied with a handheld fertilised spreader and then harrowed in with the tractor and then weeded. And we used the middle row of each plot as our sampling area. So trial conclusions for 2017 and what we've seen so far. So while the cover crop was on the field, we had a deep layer of organic matter in plots that had the mixed legume crops. There was visible fungal hyphae and mushrooms in plots, which are a positive sign for biodiversity within the soil profile. We had good moisture retention in the mixed legume plots because of the organic matter. There was nitrogen fixing by the legumes. We had biofumigant effects with, possible, uh, with some of our species, like the sun hemp and the canola, which is a positive att attribute for controlling diseases and pests. Uh, we had some very interesting data in our differences on nematodes. And we also had some symbiosis effects with some of the mixed species plots. This was interesting as their monocultures um, didn't perform until we mixed them with other legumes. Uh, there's definitely a possibility for nutrients being um, available for the subsequent cane crop. And some of our plant species have the ability to break hard compaction layers, which is a positive. All right, so we were aiming for a good green manure biomass, which is what we got here. Um, which is the pointer? Yep, that one. And in this photo, you can see where we've had our bare fallow plot. Uh, we took some data from our, from biomass, and we dried it down, and these were some of the results we got. As you can see, the sun hemp is a standout at 6.62 tonnes to the hectare of dry biomass. So that's basically you've slashed it, left it on top of your row, all the moisture's left, and this is the actual biomass that is left. Mix 5, which was both our lab labs and our soys, also did quite well. And you can see our mix 2, which had the sun hemp in it. And um, yeah, that's some of our other results there. Um, so this is Lawrence in our plot. This was the sun hemp. And as you can see, it grows a lot of biomass in as little as 60 to 90 days. Um, so from each of the biomass, we took um, samples and sent them off to the lab. And we got the nutrients for NPK and S out of the above ground biomass. So this is not including the roots or the nodules or anything. This is simply what was on top of the ground. Uh, once again, as you can see, the sun hemp is a standout with 105 um, tons to the hectare of kilos to the hectare. Sorry, kilos to the hectare of nitrogen. And our mix five is also quite impressive with 107 doing just a little bit better. Uh, mix two is also going quite well. Um, just to note, once again, that this is the top part of the soybeans, not underneath. It has been mentioned before that soybeans bring up a lot more than that, but this is just because we've measured the top. 
Uh, we're looking at phosphorus. Once again, Sun Hemp has read six easy steps with 21.53 kilos of phosphorus um, in the top part. We're assuming that some of this is going to go back down into the ground in the profile and be available for our cane crop. Um, so just looking at potassium, sun hemp once again, and pigeon pea this time was quite a good one for potassium in our um, plant uptake. Sunflowers and our mixes are always sort of sitting around that quite good average. Uh, just quickly, once again, looking at the sulphur. Uh, so here were our soil samples. Um, we took soil samples in March when the legume crop was still on, on the paddock, and we sent them away. And this is a total potential mineralized N comparison. Um, the blue is seven days, and the gray is 14 days. So anything like the sun hemp that's risen is a good sign. Um, your soybeans, you'll see, would have dropped a little bit over the 14 days in their nitrogen. Um, your bare fellow's done all right. Unfortunately, we got a little bit of weeds on our bare fellow, so I think that's why it's performed quite well. There's been a bit of um, mineralization there. Um, our desmanthus is interesting as well. Even though it looked like it didn't do that well in the plots, it still has had some quite good effects in the soil. Uh, nematode data. So we got some really interesting nematode data, as I mentioned earlier. But um, just let me give you a little spiel on nematodes. So what we got out of this trial was that um, all the counts suggest that uh, the Pratilinkus numbers increased. And this would, um, especially in the soybeans. Sorry, let me start that again. The counts from this trial suggest that all the crops, except the soybeans, have reduced the Pratilinkus numbers. This is what you would expect, as they are mainly hosted by grass species. And Pratilinkus is um, lesion nematode. <laughs> the root knot nematode populations increased on sunflowers to a, like, a level likely to cause damage to the next cane crop. And this fits with uh, literature, as sunflowers are known to be susceptible to the root knot species. Uh, the root knots increased on most of the rotation crops, but not to the same extent as the sunflowers. And interestingly enough, all the mixes were zero. Um, our Bactivore numbers, which is a free-living nematode, and they're good nematodes, uh, they increased in numbers. So in, they were higher in April than they were in November, as the legumes were only small. Uh, and these nematodes multiplied on the bacteria that are decomposing from the roots and the above-ground material. And during this process, they're making N and other nutrients available to the plant. We also had um, good num numbers in the tile and chida feed, um, nematodes. They feed on root hairs. They are also a free-living nematode, just let me mention that. Um, a high number of these is a good indication, as there is a lot of fine root hairs present, and they haven't been destroyed by pathogens. So that's what that, that tells us. It's encouraging to see reasonable numbers of the elfin chiders as well. They're also free-living. Um, they're fungivores, and their in presence indicate that there's a food source or fungi in the soil. And then we have the presence of our doralamids and our monocods, and they are omnivores and predators, and respectively tend to be good indicators of soil health. And these are, this is the graph I put together for our nematodes. I've just included all the free-living nematodes um, together, as well as the pathogenic. But what I'd like to point out here is the mixes. Um, so you've got mix two, which has very little. The blue is the pathogenic nematodes. Mix two has very little pathogenic nematodes. And we believe that's the biofumicant effect from the sun hemp. Even though the sun hemp on its own still had quite a few more, um, you know, very little. The sunflowers have obviously got quite a high number of um, pathogenic nematodes. And that's coming out in the root knot. Uh, and the lycarts are showing the same. And that is the lesion nematodes. Um, mix five has very little numbers of pathogenics, and mix three looking like the best for free living nematodes with 6,211. This is a really good nematode ratio factor, and it means that there was a good ratio of bacteria nematodes and fungal for nematodes, and these are good indicators for soil health. Worm count data, and I'll turn it back to Hayden for this one.
webcam data. FWEMs perform several important functions in the soil. They improve soil structure, water moisture, nutrient cycling, and plant growth. The bear fallow had the lowest... Earthworms will need a food source. Worms love organic matter. Worms hate cultivation, heavy tillage, will reduce earthworm population dramatically. Earthworms are a very important, of, a very important organism and have largely been forgotten in the sugarcane industry. Earthworms perform several important functions in the soil and are good indicators of soil health. Earthworms are simply rare or absent in some areas, especially sandy soil. Some soils may not even have earthworms, yet may be good fertile soils. 270 worms per square metre equals a good soil health. The bear fallow had the lowest worm count as expected, with, two, with 360 worms while the sunflower plot had the highest worm counts at 742 worms per square metre. The test was done in the plant cane and the soils was dry to moist. <coughs> Trial conclusion, stubble management and cane planting. The stubble was slashed prior to incorporation in late April 2017. Weed sprayed with spray seed at two litres per hectare at the end of May 2017. The, the, vid, the video is... Yep, the video is actually us slashing the um, sun hemp mixed fallow crop. So you can see it's quite large. It was actually over the top of the tractor when we slashed it down. The stubble was incorporated in the bed with a bed renovator 14 days before planting and nine days <laughs> The block was only retrohoed prior to the mound planting. The block was planted on the 9th of June 2017. Right, so I'm just going to go through quickly uh, a few facts on the individual legumes. But before I go on with that, I just wanted to point out a little bit. What, so we um, EM mapped the block and then um, got an EC value for each particular plot. Um, with this middle photo here, those two there, I'd just like to point out are our bare fellows. And what this is showing is moisture um, ha that hasn't been, used, hasn't been used up by the crop. So that moisture is sitting there and it's sort of a little bit waterlogged. Um, don't be alarmed by the colour difference between here and here. There is, looks quite statistically different, but there isn't actually very much between the numbers. So this indicated that our block was fairly um, consistent. So um, some of the plants we assessed was the sun hemp. Um, it's got the lovely little pea flower, yellow pea flower on it here, and it smells quite nice. Um, and it's sort of a little yep, bit there waterlogged. We go. Got a little um, don't be alarmed by the colour difference between here and here. There is, it looks quite statistically that's how it's different, done. but there isn't actually. <laughs> oh dear. All right, so that smells quite nice, and we've got our sunflower here. <laughs> oh, all right, back onto it. Um, so what do we got? In the centre photo here, we are slashing down our uh, mixed legume crop. The sun hemp is standing out here, but that is actually a mixed crop. But you can see it's quite big. It's above the tractor. And it's slashed down quite easy if you paid, in that, uh, paid attention to that video before. This is Lawrence in Brazil in 2007 in a sun hemp crop. The sun hemp doesn't get as big over there because they don't have as many sun hours in their days. If you were to plant your sun hemp in as a winter crop, It'll probably only get half the size, 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 size to flower, and that once again has to do with the sun hours during the day. Sorry? 
Okay. Oh, yeah, so sun hemp gets used as uh, green manure for the amount of biomass it creates. It also puts in a lot of nitrogen, has big nodules. Um, we use it as a cover crop and it shaded out our weeds and improved our soil erosion. It's resistant to root knot nematode and it's known for its biofumigant effects. Desmanthus was quite interesting. It looks, it looks a little, little bit, 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 bit um, lacina. Mainly we're looking at it, it has a tap root that equals to its top biomass and it holds nitrogen in an ammonian form in the soil for longer, even though it doesn't actually create nodules. Um, it has a very small seed size that can sometimes be expensive, um, but, and so there's some issues when you're trying to mix it with the fellow. Um, on it, but it does go better in a mix. On its own, it was outcompeted by weeds a little bit, as you can see. Um, but in the mix, it did some quite interesting things. Uh, we have our lab lab varieties. Uh, the new variety we tested was the 527. It had a vigorous growth spurt early, but then the other lab labs caught up and it all worked out to be the same. Good drought tolerance, good weed coverage. Um, the two lab lab varieties in the soybeans in the mix had good results. They had good biomass, they had good nitrogen, they had good worm counts, and they had low pathogenic numbers. So that's just showing the virginity of mixing our legumes together. High worth can be a weed because it flowers early, so don't use that one in your cane crop. Uh, they have poor coverage early and the planting depth, depth is critical. Seeds are prone to shattering and they need good soil moisture for the crop to establish. They can put plenty of nitrogen into our ground, as you can see, and as um, was discussed earlier. Um, there are some nematode resistant varieties that we're trying in this year's fallow. Um, but yeah, they have some nematode issues. Sunflowers. They also have nematode issues, but I do believe that if we mix them with a biofumigant, we can get the positives from the sunflowers without the negatives. So sunflowers are good at pulling up pea and zinc from the depth. They're deep-rooted, um, and they can be sensitive to the spinnaker her herbicide. But like I said, in a mix, they really have some potential there. Um, our good old cow peas, reliable, hardy seed, and easy to establish. Uh, we, in the Herbert, we're definitely looking at varieties that are root rot resistant, so Ebony and Calypso, and they're doing great in any of the mixed plots. They work as a blanket and they pull down any of the big ones um, and start breaking down that big, thick, fibrous biomass. Uh, the Pigeon Pea was something new that we tried. Uh, it was a little bit slow to establish, but it was reliable. The seed's hard, um, hardy, and it got good biomass and it had plenty of um, potassium in it. It's deep-rooted and it has a high carbon to lignin ratio and it also works really good in a mix. All right, summing it up. The good, the bad and the extras. The good. There are many great benefits to having any cover crop, but having the right mixed cover crop is looking like it has the potential to save in chemical fertilizer plot, um, inputs and improve our soil life and health. Watch this space. We're doing plenty of work in it and I think we're going to get some really good data out of it or the bad, or the issues. Some cost of the seeds are expensive, and you need different inoculums for different species. Not that we found that to be a problem, we throw them all in the mixer, mix all the different inoculums together and put it out, but you do need to have your specific inoculant for your specific legume. Some seed sizes can be an issue at planting. If you're planting something with like desmanthus, which has a really tiny seed, and sunflowers, there's going to be a few issues there, and you might have to put them out in separate boxes, separate runs, but that's something that um, we can work through, I'm sure. Some plant species may create issues, like your root knot nematode issues with your sunflowers, but once again, I th I'm sure there's a way around these things. And any cultivation of our sugarcane practices will reduce the benefits of the cover crop. Tillage is bad for microbial population and carbon accumulation. The moment we stick our cultures into our paddock, we burn all our carbon off. We spent three months building it and getting really good soil health. We can lose it like that if you over-till. And the extras. So there are a lot of extra benefits to having a mixed legume crop. Reduce erosion, um, raindrop splash, 
Uh, different species will dominate with different climates. Um, we'll increase our soil diversity, increase our carbon levels. Uh, we can increase our moisture holding capacity due to organic matter and the legume stubble. We can improve our soil structure and we can improve our quality and quantity of our soil life within a few months. Things to consider. No, I'm summing it up still. Having a mixed variety of legumes in a fallow rotation crop can improve your soil health by adding organic matter and carbon. Effectively controls weed in the fallow system for the time required of that fallow crop. And it can provide nutrients back to your soils for the following sugarcane cycle. <coughs> it will provide protection from erosion due to wind and torrential rains and floods. And it can reduce your pathogenic nematode numbers and build your free living nematode numbers, which is once again an indicator of good soil health. Things to consider if you're planting a legume crop. In the Herbert, we have low pHs, so we need to ensure that our soil pH is above 5 to allow our legumes growth. Um, avoid your early incorporation of your fallow crop. That was talked earlier before. And to get the timing right is a little bit of a, a thing. So you don't want to use up all your soil moisture, especially if you're in a dry area. In saying that, you don't want to incorporate it too early before you plant either. So that's a management thing that each individual farmer is going to have to work out. Reduce your tillage as much as you possibly can. And I understand that not everyone's soils can go minimum till or no till, but the more you can reduce your tillage and your cultivation, the better it is for your microbial population and your soil health. And if you can manage compaction through controlled traffic systems, this, you will gain the full benefits of um, this sort of fellow system. What's next? Our 2018 trial. So we just quickly look at what we've got going. OK. So yep, just having a quick look here at what we've got. We're looking at rice. Uh, this one of the soybeans is resistant to nematodes, and we've got a number of other things. Our tillage radish is looking at breaking our compaction layers and getting our organic matter deep into our soil profile. And we've got another combination of mixed species. We've got seven this time. And this is quickly just a quick photo of the trial in process. You can sort of see what's going on. That was taken with the drone. And um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Sorry I overtook the time of it. <laughs> we, we haven't got enough time to handle the questions, so Megan and Hayden and I will be able to handle them after. We've put a display outside, so there's some of the different plants and seeds out there for you to have a look at later. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Hayden, Lawrence, and Megan. That was a great presentation, and it gets good to get some results from another region on that mixed cropping. That was uh, really good, and really something to build on. Okay, our next trial is um, the Cairns area. We got a trial where we're trialling microbes in a changed farming system, and we have uh, Carissa Rickson and Mark Savina to present. A big welcome to uh, Carissa and Mark. Uh, I'll start off. Um, basically, yeah, I farm on the northern northern side of Cairns, in and we're in a unique situation where we're we're a little group on our own. Um, okay, I've got 60% of the cane area, and no one no one sort of says anything against what I do. So I I do play with a lot of different stuff, and um, my business partner McAndrew sort of scratches his head and walks away. But it's good, we get on good together. So what happened, um, I was doing trials with Derek Sparks from DP, DAF, sorry DPI, I call him DAF, and we were playing with low rates of nitrogen against normal stuff and we couldn't find any difference. So then along come Willem Lander, he's a microbiologist, he was working at Skybury Coffee at the time, and Terrain offered me some money to, to do um, rate trials with, with um, Willem's um, 
biology, that he was basically buying known biology and I was brewing it in 1,000 litre shuttles um, with molasses and just a few little things, very simple, still got it all there and we're still, I'm still using it even though I've stopped with Willem. Um, so Terrain gave us the money and we set up a three, uh, three year trial. Um, so what we're trying to do is to see what effects the biology had on, on the soil. Um, and Willem's still adamant that we could lower our, our potassium rates as well as nitrogen. Um, so we got a four hectare site and we set it up to go with, with um, trying to break down the trash and trying to get the, the crop to grow better. That was the original idea with all this, was to try and use that um, biomass on the soil to come down and, and uh, to give us a smaller crop, a uh, bigger crop. and and um, but it then developed. So then, in the end, I um, we come to the end of the three years, and so then Catalyst took on the um, recording and helping with Carissa came on board because that was one of the problems we had. Willem was a biologist and very, uh, but to record everything and keep it all in, into one was very hard. So then um, we cut we cut the final crop this year, the third year. We'll keep it going for one more year. Then I want to bring it into a fallow and then keep it running at those same rates in those GPS sites. Chris? Okay. All right. So, as we said, Mark farms up on the Barren Delta, up in Cairns region. The site, that little dot there, that little red spot, is where his was where the trial site. So, as you can see, he is surrounded by all the urban development of Cairns. So, he's got a few technic few challenges within his farming area, and he. Mark, along with a few others um, in their group, manage about 60% of the cane in the Barren Delta area. And Mark is aiming to minimise his impact, the impact of his farming practice on the neighbours and nearby residential areas as well. Not just on the environment, but he's got to be mindful of his neighbours. So aeroplanes can't go in. <laughs> We've got a few other little challenges. So this is where microbes and trying to improve soil health with microbe is becoming beneficial in his system. So as Mark said before, he'd been doing some work in with DAF and um, with Willem Landman. And part of that, he's also been involved in some nitrogen trials on Q208, where they looked at various rates of nitrogen from um, zero to 200 kilos per hectare on, on cane, on his general soils that are fairly typical to his area. And what they've found is that the optimum rate of urea in his area is between 50 and 100 kilos. So it's actually quite a wide, a wide range. The other thing is they're using targeted biology. So they're putting general biology down to start off with in the initial crop and when they first cut it. And then as the crop gets up and it gets close to canopy closure, they're, buying, they're brewing up specific cellulosic bacteria that will break down the trash. So they're leaving the trash there for as long as possible to provide a weed cane trash blanket. And then just before canopy closure, they're spraying microbes on there. They will help break it down and give the cane that last little bit of kick and to use the nitrogen out of that trash. Why? Well, it's part of remaining commercially viable in the 21st century and making farming a little bit more viable and also to trying to re reduce the DIN, the dissolved inorganic nitrogen in the environment. So this is Mark's trial here. So as he said, he's, we've cut, it's been cut for three years in a row. I've um, picked this one up already existing and just Pulled, pulled it in under Catalyst. So he's used his 120, 127 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. He's used 101 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare and he's used 54 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare plus microbes. 
By the way, there's um, a site just beside that one that Tony Webster from CSIRO is doing a trial and he's finding, yeah, something similar figures. Um, but he's come to about 100. He's saying he's getting no response after 100 units of nitrogen, Tony. So this, table, this graph here is showing us that 2015 was the dark blue, blue lines, 2016 results, which is a grey, 2017, which is a light blue, and an average from 15 to 17 in the red. And what we can see is that for all years, except for 2017, which was our third return, in total tonnes of sugar per hectare that was produced, there's no, st no statistical difference. So why, um, the two in 2017, the full rate of fertiliser had, did have statistically more tonnes of sugars per hectare in that third year, but not overall for the three years combined or any other year. Um, one more, Chris. Um, on the soil samples we took, because we took soil samples at each individual site and then added them together um, for their rate sites, um, we, on the first year, Willem found more nitrogen in the 54 units of nitrogen um, areas than, than the other two. We've got the other ones for that and I haven't pulled it together yet. <laughs> it's still sitting in my computer. Um, now, we didn't have our great economist helping us do the analysis on this one, so Mark very kindly has done a fair bit of the analysis on this one. And we've just done some a basic gross margin, um, just using assumptions. So we haven't taken out herbicide costs, but we've taken out fertilising costs and our harvesting costs and levies. So based on this, and they're the assumptions we've used, cane price for the different years varying, um, harvesting costs about $9 per tonne and urea costs of $600 per tonne, which is about where it is at the moment, I believe, um, but it could go up quite, quite easily. Now, across all three years, and as an average of all three years, your average gross margin is not significantly different. So there's a little bit in there, but it's not statistically, it's not, we can't say it's because of those treatments. It's just background noise. And that sums that one up. Questions for Mark? Yeah, right. Uh, Mark, with the 54 kilos of Ben, do you see any discoloration in the cane? No, can't pick any difference in the crops, but that has had biology on it. Um, that's probably what, whether it's releasing something in the soil, but you can't pick the difference. And, and even when we're through harvesting, because I've harvested the three sites because of um, the other machines being tied up, so we've, we've, we Mick can't pick the difference when he's driving the machine. Uh, Rob Miller, Burdick and Productivity Services. Yep. Was there a reason why you didn't have an untreated, like, like a no biology at the low fertiliser rate? Because we, we did a trial this last year with a similar sort of thing and we still got a response from the low fertiliser and it wasn't any different to uh, the plus or minus biology. Yeah, um, the only reason is I never had enough area. Um, having, having just um, four hectares uh, to fit three random six row sites in, um, that's all I had. Uh, yeah, it's worth playing with, um, and that goes back to one of the one of the reasons I did all this is there's a there's a certain gentleman around who who um, who has done a lot of trials, and I hope he can come back to the industry and give us some information. But he's saying to me between 30 and 60 is the optimum rate of fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer. Chris is just going to give a, um, sorry, a quick update on uh, Mario Racanelli's trial. Okay, a lot of you who come. Oh, 
All right. A lot of you who come to the Project Catalyst Forum last year would have seen Mario Racanello's results from his biofertiliser trials and his potassium humate trials. And there was a fair bit of interest. Um, we've now harvested the third year of the biofert trial and the second year of potassium humate. So this is just a quick update of where we're at with the results. So this is just tonnes of sugar per hectare. So in 2017, we got no statistical difference between the three different treatments, which was 100% of his normal fertiliser rate, a 75% plus um, biofertilisers, or 50% plus biofertilisers. So there was this coming year, so after three years, we found no statistical difference between tonnes of sugar produced and across all three years, on average, there's no statistical difference. On his potassium humate trial, last year we had no statistical difference between any of the, any of the treatments. So we've got three rates of fertiliser with the 25% and the 50% reduction in fertiliser having a 10 and a 20 litre per hectare of potassium humate added. This is our second season. And once again, there's no, no difference in the tonnes of sugar per hectare due to those treatments. So that was just to give you a very quick update. Thanks. Just like to call on uh, John Markley from Pharmacist just to give us a bit of a wrap of uh, today's nutrient sessions. Uh, please, John. Thanks for that. Um, just very quickly, I've, just the same as last time, just for those who probably, there was a lot to take in there. Um, so the nitrogen use varieties um, seems to be that certainly some, some, uh, some work going on there for Q240 and Q253 seems to be that if you can reduce the nitrogen rates in those, there doesn't seem to be a great deal of difference in, um, in yields. So there's some work to be done still there. Um, Interesting to see what happens the second and third years. Um, someone pointed, pointed out it could well be some um, nitrogen mining going on, but um, we're doing similar work in Mackay on some other varieties, 242. And, um, so, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. But I think there's some, some positive news that come out of that. Um, and it just reinforces that trials just can't go for one or two years. You just need multiple years because... One year can give you a result, the second year might give you a result, but the third and fourth year um, may be statistically different. Um, for the variable rate of nitrogen following soybean crop, um, really interesting results there. Um, I think everyone's seen what happens with variable rate uh, soybean, and in a lot of cases, what do growers do? A lot of cases they see that the, uh, you had some strips of no soybean and, and patches everywhere. So let's just give it the full top dress. And uh, what it's clearly showing, if you, can, if you can assess the soybean crop, it is quite easy to do a variable rate map and put on nitrogen or fertiliser at variable rates across that paddock. Um, and the results just speak for themselves. There's some savings there to be made. And the clear one that come out of there is the ability to use quick and easy method to determine how much nitrogen is still available in the soil with those nitrate strips. They're very simple to use and you can get a result in a very short period of time and make a decision on how much to reduce nitrogen by following a, a legume crop. So the mixed cropping, a um, lot of information there um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens to the cane yields um, in those sites because at the end of the day, that's the thing that's going to, to, to drive whether those mixed croppings um, continue. So the cane yields are going to be really interesting to see what happens next year um, with the results. But it, it appeared to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, but the uh, Sunhep was uh, the clear winner and any mixtures with Sunhep you know, were the clear winners. So um, I think Joe Muskett's done a lot of work with Sunhem and you know, I think Joe saw the same thing when he was doing all that work down in, in Mackay. 
Um, the microbes, well, Mark, you've got to, you know, it's, the results just speak for themselves. What, 70 units of nitrogen reduction and still growing, growing the same crop. So obviously there's some, something in there and, um, and the same with Mario's um, uh, fertiliser trials. Um, three years, again, really good results now starting to come along. Three years worth of results and not seeing any statistical differences. So there's clearly a benefit there that's happening at Mario's place. So hopefully that's a clear and a quick summary of, of today's events.